What is up guys, Karma Medic here and welcome back to another dose. Today I have an incredibly exciting video to make. I'm finally gonna be doing the decision making section. I can't even count how many comments I've gotten asking me to do decision making. So the video is finally here. If you guys haven't noticed, the channel is growing at an alarming rate. Probably by the time I upload this video, we'll have reached a thousand subscribers, which is crazy. Can't believe it's gotten this far. And I just wanna say thank you guys for watching the videos and continuing to support me. Also, I'll be doing a Q&A video soon. So make sure you leave questions down in in the comment section below. Follow me on Instagram and let's get right into the video. So guys, as a lot of you know, when I wrote the UK CAT back in 2016, the decision-making section wasn't part of the UK CAT exam. We had it on our test, but it was, they were just piloting it with us. So we had the option to do the questions, but they didn't count towards anything. So I just skipped right past it, forgot about it and moved on with my life. When you guys were requesting for me to do decision-making videos, there was a problem because I hadn't done decision-making before. What I decided to do was collaborate with Medify so that I could use their UK CAT resources to learn all the theory behind the decision-making section and then use their questions so that I could practice them and prepare myself for making this video. Now, before we get into the video where I solve questions live on camera, I wanted to give you guys a couple of general tips. I've been doing questions using the question bank for a couple of days now and I've come across a couple of patterns and things that I think will be very useful. My first tip is to be very aware of confusing phrases or very aware of phrases that have very specific meanings and you wanna know exactly what it is that they mean. For example, when I was doing the questions, I came across the word sum means any number above zero. It doesn't mean more than 50, it doesn't mean less than 50, it could be any number more than zero, but not equal to zero. Something else that I found kind of confusing, when they said less than 10, it's important to keep in mind that less than 10 could mean zero. The second tip I would give is to definitely learn Venn diagrams and probabilities well. These are topics that tend to come up in quite a lot of questions and it's fairly simple maths, but Basically, in, in Venn diagrams, if you're ever making an or statement, then you're adding the two probabilities, and if you're ever making an and statement, then you're multiplying them. That's pretty much all you need to know, but I'll go into more depth in the video. Okay, third and most importantly, what I found when doing decision-making questions is that you really needed to follow a line of logic very clearly. And the way that I did this was to use diagrams, very, very simple diagrams similar to this, just with letters, arrows, maybe some crosses, just to indicate exactly how the logic flows from one part of the question to the next. Practice reading the question and summarizing it into a small diagram. Then when you read the different statements, you can take them, use your diagram to figure out where they fit or if they don't fit and answer the question really quickly. My fourth tip is to not make any assumptions. If you can't conclude a statement directly from the question or from the paragraph that's given to you, then it's wrong. And my fifth and final tip is to just follow simple, logical trains of thought trails of thought. Don't make the question process more difficult for yourself. Don't complicate things. Just make it in a step A, step B, step C fashion so that you can follow everything simply. Now with the general tips out of the way, let's jump straight into the questions and go to my computer. So here we are on the Medify dashboard. This is where you can see all the tutorials for the different sections of the UK CAT. And you can also see down here how you're doing compared to other students on Medify. So this is the tutorial for the decision-making section that I've watched in full to prepare for this video. And it teaches you the theory behind the decision-making section and goes through a couple of questions too. And over here, there's hundreds and hundreds of questions for each section. I've mainly focused on the decision-making. You guys can see that I've been doing pretty well in the decision-making section. These questions where I got a zero out of one, I've actually gotten four out of five. But if you get one of the five questions wrong, it marks it as a zero. So as you can see here, I got four out of five right. I'm actually pretty surprised with how quickly I've been able to do well in decision-making. I found the questions kind of fun, almost like a game. And so it's been, it's been really interesting for me to solve them. Let's do some practice questions. I'm gonna go down to the decision-making section and I'm gonna choose the general one that has all the questions included together. And yeah, let's get started. So these kinds of questions where you're asked to select the strongest argument from the statements below, you wanna make sure you make as little assumptions as possible. You wanna pick answers that are based on statistics or based on facts and that directly relate to the question, directly try and solve a problem that's in the question. Something like that. You don't want to do anything that's opinion-based or something that's just not relevant. So let's read the question. Should people who are addicted to illegal drugs be treated for their addiction to the NHS rather than imprisoned if called by the, by the police? Yes, people who are addicted to illegal drugs recover much more quickly with the help of NHS. Okay, not bad. Yes, success or recovering from addiction has proven to be 55% when treated by the NHS, but only 21% when released from prison. That's a great answer because it's saying that it's a good idea to be treated by the NHS and it gives statistics to back up that claim. There's no point in these drugs being illegal if the police will not imprison them. It's an opinion. These people may also be selling drugs to others. This is based on no facts, it's just an opinion. I think the first one is pretty good, but the second one is even better. Next question. 
Should the NHS stop the funding of PrEP, which can protect the partners of people with HIV from infection in order to save money which can be spent on treating patients with cancer? Yes, because a report found that there are other cheaper ways of preventing the transmission of HIV, but no other cost-effective ways to treat cancer patients. That's a very good answer because it um, shows A, that there's a report, so there's been some research, and it, it answers the question directly that we can use other more cheaper methods to protect from HIV, whereas we can't do that for cancer. So we wanna save where we can and keep using the money where we can't. Yes, because PrEP prevents infection rather than treating it. Okay, I mean, that's a good answer, but not as good as this. No, because it's discriminating opinion. Uh, no, because there's strong evidence to suggest that this can drastically reduce transmission. This is good, but it only answers the first part of the question. It doesn't have anything to do with patients uh, who need to be treated for cancer. Okay, so these types of questions where you're asked to choose if a conclusion can follow from the passage, you definitely want to read the passage first so you understand what the context is that's going on. And me personally, I like to draw diagrams so that I can just quickly follow the logic that's in the question. Sometimes there's a ton and ton of information and I find that simplifying it into a diagram is really helpful. So let me show you guys and you'll see what I mean. Conformists aren't always weak, but they are always ignorant. So C to I, sometimes weak. Not all those that are ignorant are weak, but they will be arrogant. So some ignorant, weak, all ignorant, arrogant. So this is what I've drawn on my piece of paper, okay? It's very simple, very uh, meaningless to anyone else. It makes perfect sense to me, and it helps simplify all the different things that I read in the passage into a diagram form. It makes it easier for me to follow. Maybe try this out, if it helps you, then great. If it doesn't, don't worry, you don't need to use it. So this first statement that says, all those that are ignorant are conformists, the passage at the very beginning says the opposite thing. And if the passage says conformists are always ignorant, it doesn't follow that ignorant people are always conformists. So keep that in mind, the, the, the sentence doesn't go both ways. So this is a no. A weak conformist will be ignorant. Conformists aren't always weak, but they are always ignorant. So whether they're weak or not, they're still gonna be ignorant, so this is true. A weak person cannot be arrogant. All those that are ignorant are weak. Not all those that are ignorant are weak, but they will be arrogant. So if you're ignorant, you are arrogant. And here it says a weak person cannot be arrogant. That's not true, we know it's the opposite. Some arrogant people will be conformists. Conformists are always ignorant, okay? <laughs> um, uh, not all those that are ignorant are weak, but they will be ignorant, arrogant. So if you're ignorant, you're arrogant and Conformists are always ignorant. So some arrogant people will be conformists, I think is true. More ignorant people are weak than arrogant. Wow, this is confusing. No, <laughs> those that are ignorant are weak, but they will be arrogant. So more people are arrogant. So this is a no. This last sentence says that more people are arrogant than they are weak um, if they're already ignorant. I know that's a lot of words that sound very similar, so <laughs> Hopefully it makes sense. So now we have a Venn diagram question. I strongly suggest that you read the question first so that you know exactly what relevant information to go look for in the passage, and then you pick out the relevant information. Based on the diagram, which statement is true? Survey, I don't care, multiple types. So these are all the different Venn diagrams and their corresponding things. So let's go through the statements one by one and decide if they're true or false. Six people like just nature. So which one's nature? Triangle. Six people like just nature. That is very true. <laughs> And we can stop right there because there's six here that fall into this triangle that don't fall into the circle, rectangle, or this trapezoid here. So six people like just nature. That is true. And we'll stop there. Or we'll do the rest. Two people like game shows and period piece dramas. So game show is this, period piece drama is the rectangle. So people who like both uh, period piece drama and game shows is four, so that's false. Eight people like game shows. Game shows is a circle. If you add all these numbers up, that's more than eight. Nine people like soap operas. If you add these up, it's more than nine. So it's just that first one. Next question. Amy's buying an external hard drive. She has the choice of either magnetic or solid state. So magnetic, solid state. The probability that a hard drive will be damaged is 0 0.6 for magnetic, 0 0.3 for a solid state. Probability that a hard drive will fill up before six months is 60% for magnetic and three fifths for solid state. Three fifths is also the same as 60%. Hopefully you guys know that. So considering only the likelihood of the hard drive being damaged or filled up before six months, should Amy buy the solid state hard drive? So it damaged or filled up before six months, let's see which one happens first. So uh, that means you have to add the two probabilities. So the probability for the magnetic one is 0 0.6 
plus 0 0.6, which is equal to 1.2. And the probability for the solid state is 0 0.3 plus 0 0.6, which is 0 0.9. So should she buy the solid state hard drive? I would say yes. The solid state hard drive is less likely to be damaged. That is true. Yes, the solid state hard drive is more likely to fill up slower than a magnetic hard drive. No, they're likely to fill up at the same rate. So the answer is A, the first one. Okay, we have another one of these yes-no questions, so let's read the passage first. Only either Ian or Carl was successful for a job, okay? After they both had an interview on Thursday, all the applicants except for Carl had over 10 year experience. Applicants greater than 10 years, except Carl. Some applicants with experience have excellent communication skills. Some applicants with experience communication. No applicants from Manchester received an interview. Okay, I think my diagrams aren't gonna be very useful for this one, so I'm just gonna look at the passage. Ian has over 10 years experience. All applicants except for Carl had over 10 years experience, so that means that Ian had over 10 years experience. If Carl was successful at interview, he, Ian must have been from Manchester. Only one of them was successful. No applicants from Manchester received an interview. So if Carl was successful at interview, Ian must be from Manchester. Could he have been from somewhere else and not received an interview after they both had an interview? So he can't be, okay, so since we know Ian and Carl both had an interview and no applicants from Manchester received an interview, then Ian cannot be from Manchester. Otherwise he would have not had an interview, but we know that he did. Carl does not have experience, so he does not have excellent communication skills. Some applicants with experience have excellent communication skills. So some of them do, some of them don't. So we can't say, um, oh, Carl does not have experience. He does not have excellent. Some applicants with experience have excellent, but it doesn't say anything about applicants without experience. Some applicants without experience could also have excellent communication skills. So we can't say that this is true. Yeah, it's not true. Ian is not from Manchester. Let's see, what do we know about Ian? One of them was successful. All applicants except for Carl had over 10 years experience. So Ian has 10 years experience. I don't know if we can make this statement. I'm gonna go with no, because we don't know if he was success. Oh yes, of course we know. So they both had an interview and no applicants from Manchester received an interview. So Ian is not from Manchester because we know that he had an interview. That was similar to this question here. Applicants interviewed on Wednesday were not successful. We don't know anything about that. We just know that they, these two people had an interview on Thursday. Okay, so it turns out that I got this question partially correct. Let's see which question I got wrong. So this one, applicants interviewed on Wednesday were not successful. This can be concluded as the stem states that only either Ian or Carl were successful and they were both interviewed on Thursday. So everyone interviewed on Wednesday must have not been successful. Okay, fine. Given, given the, the assumption that there is only one job taken up for a successful job, Okay, and they both had an interview on Thursday and only one was successful, which means that anyone who interviewed on other days was not successful. So that's my bad in the reasoning. Hopefully that's okay. Anyway, let's move on to more decision-making questions. So, should a prime minister require political experience before leading the country? Again, with these questions, don't make any assumptions. Try and look for answers that involve statistics, involve reports, involve research, involve facts. Should a prime minister require political experience? Yes, most jobs require experience before being accepted. The role of prime minister is no different. This is an opinion. Having a background in politics is most likely to provide a potential prime minister with the relevant skills required to carry out the role. Okay, an opinion, but seems pretty good. No, in the past, prime ministers with political experience have been no more effective statistically than prime ministers without political experience. No, the most important thing is that they understand the needs of the country as a whole. Okay, so three is definitely the correct answer, and here's why. So you really need to keep your personal opinion out of these questions. <laughs> for example, uh, for me, if I was going on personal opinion, I would have easily just quickly chose this, chose this answer and, been, and moved on. In this question, the third answer shows that in the past, from experience, from evidence, from research, that it hasn't been as effective, and that's the one we're gonna choose. More of these questions. Either Zoe or Rachel raised the money Raise the most money at the student bake sale for the charity committee. All of the students except Rachel are graduates. Some of the graduates are also on the netball team. No student studying chemistry raised the most money at the bake sale. Zoe is a graduate, so she's on the netball team. Some of the graduates are also on the netball team, so it, you don't have to be on the netball team if you're a graduate. If Rachel raised the most money at the bake sale, Zoe is studying chemistry. Either Zoe or Rachel raised the most money at the bake sale. No student studying chemistry raised the most. So. If Rachel raised the most money, then Zoe is studying chemistry. True. 
Rachel is not a graduate, so she is not on the netball team. We know that some of the graduates are on the netball team, but it doesn't mean that a non-graduate could not also be on the netball team. So that's a no. Zoe raised the most money at the bake sale. She's not studying chemistry. That's true because no student studying chemistry raised the most money at the bake sale. If a graduate raised the most money at the bake sale, Zoe does not study chemistry. A graduate, all the students except Rachel are graduates. So if it was a graduate, then it could have been Zoe. If Zoe, if a graduate raised the most money at the bake sale, Zoe does not study chemistry. Yes, this is true. All right, let's see. I've gotten four out of five correct on this question. Let's see which one I got wrong. If Rachel raised, if Rachel raised the most money at the bake sale, Zoe is studying chemistry. If Rachel raised the most money at the bake sale, we could conclude that she is not studying chemistry. Yeah, but Zoe may or may not be studying chemistry and the text does not specify. Oh, my mistake. Yeah, so if we, if we, we know that Rachel is not studying chemistry, but we don't know about Zoe. My bad. Homework should be banned in order to give students more time for extracurricular activities. Personal opinion, of course, I'm going to say yes. No student wants homework, but try and push that aside when you read through the question and look for anything that involves statistics or past research. Yes, most children find that they spend most of their free time completing the homework that they have been sent. Okay, opinion. Yes, statistically, homework has been shown not to improve academic performance. It would be better for children to spend their time on activities that develop extracurricular skills instead. It sounds pretty good. No, most parents think that if their children manage parents thinking it's an opinion. It's no. Children in countries where homework is not generally given have similar levels of academic performance to those in countries where homework is encouraged. Okay, that's also pretty good. Homework has been shown not to improve academic performance. It would be better for children to spend their time on activities. <clears throat> so this part here is an opinion and it addresses extracurricular activities. The re this one sounds good too, but the reason I'm not gonna choose it is because it doesn't do anything to address the second part of the question, which is extracurricular activities. So I'm gonna go with the second option. Next question. So an audit was performed detailing the number of surgeries performed by each individual surgeon in the past few months. It was found that a total of this many surgeries were performed by four members, surgeon X, surgeon Y, whatever. Which of the following must be true? Surgeon Y performed the most. Y performed a third of all. And there was total was 339. So 339 um, times 0 0.33333. So surgeon Y did 112, let's call it 113. And did anyone do more? 35, a third of all, 27 and the remaining. So let's see, 113 plus 35 plus 27 and 175, let's call that. 339 minus 175 so we know that surgeon Z performed 164. So the first option can't be true. At least 100 surgeries were performed each month. This was over the last three months. We don't know if all of these were performed in one month or in half a month or over three months. So I don't think we can answer that. Surgeon Z performed the most. We already know this is true from before. So that's what I'm gonna go with. Okay, next question. So all adults that watch horror movies also enjoy thriller. All the adults in the cinema are over 20. A few of the adults in the cinema do not enjoy watching comedy. And none of the adults that enjoy sci-fi have children. So there are only adults in the cinema. I don't think we can say that. It doesn't tell us whether there are children or not also in the cinema. Horror movies are more popular among adults than comedy movies. All adults that watch horror movies enjoy thriller. Okay. The adults in the cinema are over 20. A few of the adults do not enjoy watching comedy. So I would say it's the opposite. I would say comedy is more popular. The adults in the cinema may have children. All adults that watch horror movies, all the, all the adults in the cinema are over 20. Yeah, they could, they could have children. None of the adults that enjoy sci-fi have children, but adults that enjoy other kinds of genres could have children. Tony is an adult in the cinema. He cannot be watching comedy. A few of the adults in the cinema do not enjoy watching comedy but there are still adults that do enjoy it. So this is not true. Thriller TV series are popular amongst adults that watch horror movies. All adults that watch horror movies also enjoy thriller. So that's true. Great. I'm gonna read the questions and then go to the graph and the passage and pick out the meaningful and relevant information. So secretion of growth hormone stops in the afternoon between 12 and two. Growth hormone between 12 and two in the afternoon PM, it stops. Okay, it definitely decreases, but I don't know if it stops. Um, it just might be at a lower level, so I'm gonna say no. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it stops because even at two, there is still a basal level. 
so I'm gonna say no. Strenuous exercise can lead to acromegaly in adults. Acromegaly, um, here, high levels of constant secretion of growth hormone causes acromegaly, okay? Does strenuous exercise lead to uh, high concentrations? So here we see that strenuous exercise decreases the concentration, so I'm gonna go with no. Blood concentrations of growth hormone were lowest at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. is somewhere here, and that seems to be the lowest, so I'm gonna go with yes. The average adult exercises, um, I mean, I don't know anything about the average adult. Hypoglycemia during sleep caused secretion during midnight. Okay, hypoglycemia, so not eating or having low blood sugar levels during sleep caused secretion at midnight. Um, during midnight, we stop secretion. In fact, we were increasing previously to midnight, and at midnight, we stopped, so I'm gonna go with no. Okay, so again, I've managed to get one out of the five questions wrong in these types of questions. Average adult exercises, I said no, the correct answer was yes. If you get any question wrong, or if you're really, really struggling on a question, just answer it, guess it, skip, and move on, because there'll be plenty of questions that are easier to answer, simpler, and all questions are worth the same mark. All right, guys, so I've done quite a few questions, as you can see. Down here, I've done 30 questions today. This sort of keeps track of how many questions you're doing over time, so you know if you've been consistent in your studying. So that's it for me, that's enough decision-making questions in one day. I learned everything about the decision-making questions from Medify, I watched their tutorial, the video that they have to sort of explain the theory behind the section, and then I did some practice questions over the last couple of days before recording this video. And yeah, hopefully you guys can see that I've been able to do well and my progression over time. I hope you guys were able to follow my logic, I hope it all made sense, and I hope that you found this video useful and interesting. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more videos from me. I have a lot of exciting things coming in the future. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.